Flawcast episode 178. Until you suffer some, part two. Suffering only shows where you are attached. That is why, to those on the path, suffering is grace. Ram Das. Flawcast. Get in the arena. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. All of our esteemed Flawcast listeners I want to welcome and thank everybody for coming back to another fun filled, triggering, hopefully convicting <laughs> episode of Flawcast. As always, my partner in crime, Mr. Carl Tuckerson, is by my side. How you doing, Mr. Tuckerson? Mr. William, I feel like I've been rebooted. How about you? <laughs> Everything is going well. That, I'm recharged, rebooted, and I'm ready for action. That That's awesome. We've been having uh, tremendous technical and uh, dog difficulties this morning at the Flawcast World Headquarters, but uh, hopefully Jesus is helping beat the technical Computers demons. Computers are a little different than humans, but I feel like we all need a reboot sometimes, I, I'm and not we just that. gave the system the reboot it needed. So. There you go. So we are now in the holiday seasons. I want to, uh, as you're listening to this, it is Black Friday, so I want to thank everybody and wish you a very happy Thanksgiving. Carl, happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, Mr. William. We have a lot to be thankful for. We do. All right. Well, uh, once again, welcome and thank everybody. Please share. Uh, I'm going to be honest. I don't think people really dug the last episode. Carl thinks this is because we're entering into the holiday season. Uh, but I, I do think my personal bias aside that I there was a message I, I delivered. I do think it's an important message, and it also is very important that if you're going to listen to this week, that you go back and listen to last week if you missed it. So uh, this one is just going to piggyback right off of that. Carl's going to get into that. Uh, a couple of things. We're going to do the shake and howdy. I uh, want to once again welcome everybody and ask everybody to share. We're on all of the podcast platforms you can find or you can think of. You can just type in Flawedcast CLE. I know we're on Apple. We're on Google Play. We're on Spotify, Breaker, Anchor.fm. We are also on the video platform, Rumble, that's under Flawed Inc., as well as the Project Mockingbird social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Getter, and Gab, all under Flawed Inc. Uh, there is a link in the description to uh, get a copy of my book, Smith's Heart of Man Repair Manual. Uh, make sure you pick that up. And uh, uh, our email is flawedinccle at gmail.com. And I want to give a big thank you and shout out to my wife, Mrs. Smith, who is dog sitting as I am editing this video. Uh, I love you, babe. Thank you so much. We're just going to get into it because I, I think that this is going to be really interesting segue into this holiday season where we do celebrate the birth of Christ. If if it isn't historically accurate, it's symbolically um, where we do choose to recognize the birth of our Savior. Um, so, Carl, if you want to grip and rip it, we'll just get after it. I'd love to. Mr. William, you had no idea that when you presented the podcast last week that you were on the path that I was on. Funny thing, we did not talk about that. <laughs> we really didn't. But I had already been thinking about your perspective of Jesus and him learning, him showing obedience to the Father. And I guess we need to go to one of the hardest things that we can comprehend how is it possible that Jesus was 100% God, keeping the purity through the seed of the Holy Spirit at the time of the conception that was given to Mary? That's one facet. 100% God, but yet 100% man, human. And that part of him came from Mary. And the natural birth, the going of the labor, the being birthed like you and I, and not just spoken into existence and instantaneously being on the scene, but the whole nine-month period to grow in a womb and develop. And so we need to understand. Well, I would even add, not to interrupt you, the, one of the things I think is so magnificent as nowadays, it's nomenclature, but at the time, her being unwed, being a virgin, being betrothed to Joseph, her earthly husband, and then just saying, hey, Holy Spirit, uh, and I uh, conceived this child, where the scandal of being 
unmarried and and being a young they they say 13 or 14 most historians when she was born or when Christ was born like the 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 social the just the controversy behind just that alone that Christ is brought into the most lowly indignant uh, manner at that time is so striking to me nowadays there really isn't a stigma no not for at all for that type of family situation there, i mean there's um, shows on it on that, tv about it and yeah it, at that time yeah. those were actually um punishable by death. death yeah and so that was the beginning those were his beginnings that surrounded him but in dealing with jesus's deity and humanity all in one we're going to look at Going back to Hebrews chapter 5, as you produced last week in a wonderful podcast, Thank and you. we're going to look at it from the perspective of why it was necessary. Why did this happen? Why did this have to happen? And I think it's only right that we would begin to cover a few verses going back to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. Now, Jesus did a lot of things on earth while he was here in his 33 and a half years. But throughout all the things that Jesus did, there was always the greatest act of all, or there was always, I don't, want to, I don't know if I can say the main reason that he was here, but definitely the climax of all that he achieved on earth, did on earth, went through on earth, was the crucifixion. And that was always ahead of him until the end. And let us go to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, beginning, and I'll read there. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. So there was a system of sacrifice that was in place at the time of Jesus's birth. The priest would offer up sacrifices for the people, but because the priests were human, they first had to offer up a sacrifice for their own sins, their own humanity, their own imperfection to even be in a position to represent the people. And so one of the things that Jesus had to do was fill the role of the high priest. That was part of what God's plan was for him. He had to act in the position and represent the high priest role by giving sacrifices for us. So we're establishing that the high priest's role was to stand in the gap for humanity in the position of sins and how they came against God. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 3 through 4. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sins. This is talking about the earthly uh, high priest. He has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. No one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So you don't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a priest filling the gap between God's wrath for sin and and achieving mercy for the humanity of the people for their salvation. And Jesus also in this role was chosen by God as his own son to stand in the gap for us. So we're going to continue on. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Today I have deemed you. Today I have established you. Not only as my son, but you're going to be a high priest. You're going to represent humanity and the sins of humanity. He says also in another place, you are um, 
You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I, you know, the Amplified says this. I, I, I'm not sure what translation you use. I, I like the Amplified because to me it, it like simplifies it. And not only that, but it expounds, and I yeah. like expounded explanation of things. But it says here, uh, starting in verse 1, for every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in things relating to God so that he may offer both gifts and sacrifice for sins. Verse 2, he is able to deal gently with the spiritually ignorant and misguided since he is also subject to human weakness. And because of this human weakness, he is required to offer sacrifices for sins for himself as well as for the people. Verse 4, and besides, one does not appropriate for himself the honor of being high priest, but who is called by God just as Aaron was. And then going to verse 5, so to Christ did not glorify himself as to be made high priest, but he was exalted and appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I I have begotten or fathered you declare the authority and rule over the nations. So in, in a nutshell, what you're saying is that to become a priest then and now, uh, and I would even say if you are called to be a minister, there is a supernatural confirmation of that usually. And, and even back then, like you didn't, wasn't it only the tribe of the of Levites? Could it was be, the Levites. The Levites the could, could, they were, they were considered of the 12 tribes to be the priestly class that if the priests were, if someone were to be a priest, they would tr- come from the tribe of Levite. Uh, um, so there, there is even a, a separation of that. And what you're saying that I believe is that in this Melchizedek you can read about in the Old Testament mm-hmm. was a priest. However, he was also a king. That's right. And the, the significance of that and why it says that Christ was in the order of Melchizedek because Christ is the chief of all priests and he is also the king of all kings. Yes. And when the scripture says that he was in the order of Melchizedek, what that is simply saying is that uh, there's uh, there's always a, a forerunner. I yes. believe God always sends a, a, a forerunner like John the Baptist before Christ. Paving the way. Exactly. However, in this regard, Melchizedek who ruled people but also had the anointing or the calling, the gifting of God to offer up these sacrifices, not just for him, for his people, that seldom, other than Melchizedek, Christ is it. the only, per, yes, that's the only that person it. in the entirety of the scriptures. And the theologians will teach that, why? Why did that only happen, like, with Melchizedek one time? Well, we would say that that was an actual foreshadow, an actual representation of what was to come. It was an actual paving the way in a system, but even though he did that, and even though he was the only one to do that, he was still human, and he still gave in to sin and temptations over and over again, because he was 100% man absent of any deity that came from heaven. And that's why in that portion of Hebrews, it says that the, the chief priest not only made supplications or, or for sacrifices the for the people, but for himself. Right, because they would put bells on them. Mm-hmm. And when they would go in on several occasions, the priest had not properly repented of their own sins, offered sacrifices properly for their self. And I would say in those situations, Mr. William, it became, again, ritualistic for them. I mean, you can see all throughout history in, in, in Christian time periods where serving God and going to church at times can become routine and just religious. Right. And that is not something that you would want to happen if you were a priest. Well, and just to touch on something, because I, I, there's always these comparisons to things were and then now how things should be, the priest would wear a bell and then have a rope tied around mm-hmm. around the priest, th- around their, their foot 
because if they entered That's right. the Holy of Holies is what they call it. This is where they offered the sacrifice for the nation of Israel. Mm-hmm. If they weren't ceremonially clean, and and you're right, it got ritualistic to where, okay, I'm going to follow the law. That's right. And, and Christ, as Redeemer, came to redeem us from the curse of the law and make it so that it's a matter of our heart, yes. not, not in a list, a checklist. But the larger point being is that these priests would go in. If they weren't right, the bell would ring, and that would signify to the people to pull the rope because yeah. they literally fainted, or not fainted, they literally died as, in the presence of the Almighty. So they knew, okay, right. we got to pull as this guy out and get another guy. As long as the bell was dinging, they knew that the priest was performing the sacrifices. Once they would hear the bell stop, right. they knew that this priest is dead. Right, he I got it backwards. Right? Literally, this priest didn't cleanse himself, didn't repent, didn't stand as acceptable to God. And when the bell stopped ringing, they would just go get you know the second round guy the the backup priest right. to go in and i promise you he probably made sure <laughs> that everything was settled between him and god at that point right because that's a big wake up call yeah so but what i wanted to touch on i we just needed to just lay that groundwork of the system of priest and we need to understand that jesus fed into his disciples by teaching them He befriended them and became an example to them. He healed the sick. He mended the broken heart. He performed miracles. He did all of these things, but throughout his life, even though he was doing these things, he knew what lied ahead. He knew that he was going to be the sacrifice. He knew that he had to do that so that he could serve in the eternal position of priest. One sacrifice, once and for all, blood shed only one time. But that blood had to be perfect. And that is why he had to be sinless, because not only was he going to serve as priest forever, as we see in these verses we just read, but he himself was also going to be the sacrifice. So here is a very mysterious picture. We have Jesus who was going to be the king of kings. So as Melchizedek was a king, Jesus would be not only a king, but the king of kings. We had Jesus who was going to be the priest, as Melchizedek was. But not only was he going to be a priest, he was going to be an eternal priest standing in the gap of death and wrath that would come upon us, serving God as that eternal priest. But then you also have another dimension to Jesus that no no other human had ever had. Jesus was also going to be the sacrifice. So he was going to be the king of kings. He was going to be the priest to priest, and he was also going to be that sacrifice, that payment, that blood sacrifice that would go on the altar and would cover our sins forever. And so that is the uniqueness of all the things that Jesus was to achieve during his earthly ministry. But he knew that that was going to cost him his life. And so I would like you to read, because I like your translation that you have, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. I would like you to read that, and then I would like us to talk about it. It talks about the suffering and learning the obedience that you dealt with last week. Okay. Hebrews 5, 7, 8 in the Amplified says, In the days of his earthly life, Jesus offered up both specific petitions and urgent supplications for that which he needed with fervent crying and tears to the one who was always able to save him from death. And he 
was heard because of his reverent submission towards God, his sinlessness and his unfailing determination to do the Father's will. Although he was a son who had never been disobedient to the Father, he learned active special obedience through that he suffered. And and that's what was the key verse that Christ learned obedience through his suffering right. from last and week. And some people would have to say, first of all, how did Jesus have to learn anything? That would be the first one because he was perfect and he was 100% God. The other one would be like, well, how did he have to learn obedience? Well, I want to talk about that. When Jesus would get alone from the crowd and the Bible said, In several of the four Gospels that Jesus would leave the crowd and he would be alone and he would pray all night. You would read about him praying all night. You would read about him getting away from the crowd. Well, that's what happened the night that Peter walked on water. It is what happened. He he went ahead to spend time and they're like, hey, we're going to shove off. And then, you know, is that a... Is that a, a specter? A is that a you know? Is that a poltergeist that's walking towards us? But it was in fact Christ after he had spent that required alone time in the wilderness by himself. Correct. And so we look at learning a special kind of obedience. If you go back to the beginning of Hebrews, you see that one of the reasons that the priest could actually serve as representing the people was because of their humanity, the priest understood the temptations that the humans were going through because they were also tempted. You know, they understood um, the struggle that the humans were going through, that the children of Israel were going through because they themselves went through that struggle. One of the things that we have to understand and we have to accept is that Jesus had to be tempted in all manners, even as we are tempted, because he had to beat that temptation. He had to go through a trial period of 40 days and 40 nights in the deserts, in the desert, where he fasted and prayed and was tempted by Satan. The thing that we miss sometimes, Mr. William, is that Jesus's obedience that he learned as a man is what qualified him to have victory over sin. And when Jesus would get alone and he would pray with fervent prayers, and that word means fiery, it it means not just a thank you, I lay myself down to sleep, bless me, amen, and it's over. It means that he, as he did in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed with such fervency and it was such a physically tasking event because of what he was going to face that his sweat became his blood. And Jesus, at any time, he could have called legions of angels so that he would not have to go through the crucifixion. He, He battled that. He had to suppress the flesh part of him because it was the Father's will that he would be the sacrifice. It was the Father's will that Jesus would be that one-time perfect sacrifice. But if Jesus was going to be that one-time perfect sacrifice, he was going to have to be tempted to sin. So Jesus had to be tempted by Satan. Jesus had to have the lure to disobey the will of God by calling the angels. And that is why God said that, you know, at any time, all you have to do is say the word and I will allow the angels to take you out of this plan. And when Jesus would get to the point where he was exhausted and he was tired and he had had energy go out of him because he healed the people, he raised the dead at his moments of weakness, that thought came to him. I still have to go to the cross. I don't want to do that. I have to get alone. I have to beat 
this temptation to sin against the Father, and I must learn to obey. I must learn to deny. I must have victory over the temptation to be disobedient, or I have no authority over that sin. And that is why Jesus had to suffer. That is why Jesus had to be tempted. That is why Jesus had to experience that. Because to have supreme authority and supreme victory over Satan, you have to have defeated Satan against those lies, against those deceptions, against those tricks, and even the truth that were to say, I will give you this kingdom. I will, all you have to do is worship me and I will give you all of this, all of the air under the third heaven and down, which is my domain. I will give you the ruleship. He had to be tempted like that so he could defeat that. Uh, no, what you're saying is scripturally accurate, but I would, I, as you're talking about the human birth of the man, Jesus, yes. I would even begin to say, as I feel like sometimes it's almost like millisecond by millisecond, there's a temptation. And, and, and any more, like, it's like the longer you go on this, this journey, the deeper you go into trying to discover the heart of Christ, there are things that wreck you far beyond when you start. Like, there, there's like the topical, you know, beatitude type, the introductory, the milk if you will, mm -hmm. uh, when regarding temptation, but like, like I, I, I'll be honest with you. Like I've been reading first and second John this week. And it's like when John basically says, if you don't love your brother, you're, you're sinning. Mm -hmm. Like I, and we're coming into the holidays. Like I genuinely struggle with that. Yeah. I, I, and, and it, it's, I'm reading the word of John and I'm like, I'm, I am being convicted of this because I, I genuinely struggle with that. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we're going to the holidays and just all that. But my thought process, and it's not to remove the dignity and the divinity from Christ, but it's to, I would say, highlight the humanity. I think that he was tempted on a, not just in a 40-day period, but it had to be a moment by moment. Like, like, I, and I don't, I don't think the temptation, at least for me, would be like that element, the things that would trip you and I up. It would be like, you know, here's this guy who's being tormented by a legion of demons and knowing who that he's the son of God and he could do whatever and being restrained by his, his physical flesh. Like, I, I would think that's a, a, a way of suffering. Or, like, when you're being degraded and demoralized by th this uh, hierarchical Levitical priesthood who Christ was the fulfillment and the perpetuation of the law, and he knew that he is the law embodied, and they're accusing him of breaking that law. As a man, I got to think, like, you know, it's just these temptations that are, are this succumbing to the obedience through that suffering, because I got to believe that as a man being tempted in every manner we were would have to deal with like fighting that to be like, nah, I'm there's mm, not a know. sin that is committed that Jesus did not overcome and did not defeat. And the reason that that had to happen is because one of the greatest mysteries that that exist is summed up in what I'm getting ready to say. And it really summarizes all of Christianity. Jesus had to hang on the cross as if he sinned so that we could live life as though we have not sinned. And that is the biggest I, twist. Wait, 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 wait. Say that one more time. I will say that again, and I'm glad that you're given the open door. This is the e exact summary of the reason that Jesus had to be tempted. He had to learn the obedience. He had to go through everything that we are going through because unlike Adam, Jesus wasn't going to commit the sin. Jesus was not going to rebel. Jesus was not going to give in to pride. But Jesus himself had to hang on the cross as if he had committed sin so that we could live life here on earth as though we have not sinned.
And, and that's that not is sin, the mystery. And that's not sin singularly. No, that's it's sin, committed sin. every single sin that we have committed. Right, that 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 ever was, ever will is, be, and ever will be. And he had to be tempted with those, so that he could defeat it. He could defeat the temptation. He could submit to obedience because that's one of our biggest struggles is that we disobey. And so Jesus in so many ways had the opportunity to disobey the will of the Father. He in so many opportunities had the freedom to commit acts of sin and yet he lived above it because as the one time final blood sacrifice to be given for our sins, he had to defeat that because Adam gave in. And through the seed of Adam, humanity comes and humanity is tainted. Humanity gives into disobedience. It gives into sin. It commits sin. We all have because we are human and we are not perfect. But Jesus was perfect. So because of that act that he did by obeying the Father until his death, we now are able to live life as though we were the ones that did not commit sin. We were the ones that did not partake in any disobedience. And that's the beauty of grace. It's the mystery of grace. It's the power of grace. And that is why Jesus was the one time, and, and you read in Hebrews chapter 5 throughout there, that he was the eternal sacrifice, one time, good forever, and serves as our priest who is able to represent us as blameless. Why? Because Jesus was. It's not that we were, but by accepting that sacrifice, we are able to stand against Satan and the kingdoms of hell and demon power and authority of heavenly beings that are evil, and we get to stand there as if Jesus is standing there in his blood sacrifice. And it's the biggest mystery. It's the biggest thing going into this Thanksgiving season. All of us have had suffering. All of us have had pain. All of us have had hurt. We have the greatest reason to make this Thanksgiving season be different than any of the other ones because we embrace the totality of the miraculous gift that Jesus gave us as we track it through Hebrews chapter 5. As we understand what Jesus did for us and how that one time act is eternally securing our eternity in heaven, and it can never be questioned, it can never be shaken, it can never be doubted. Satan has no power to come against it because he was defeated. And we have that reason to go into this year with gratitude and thankfulness and recognize that in less and then a week away, we're going to sit down and we're going to get fat and we're going to enjoy food and we're going to have family. But don't lose sight of one of the greatest things we have. Well, the greatest thing, the most amazing thing that we have in this upcoming Thanksgiving season is that Jesus was tempted in all manners like we are and he sinned not. He was blameless. He dominated disobedience. He dominated pride. He dominated every act of sin that we have committed and was above it and blameless. And he hung on that cross as if he had sinned and he gave his life so that we could live our life here as though we have not. And that's the most amazing, mysterious, powerful story found in scripture. Because it's the one that makes us justified to walk on streets of gold, to worship around the throne of God, and to spend our eternity in heaven. In addition to that, what I would say is that, and this is kind of where I was coming from last week, is that, you know, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And certainly, you know, I, I really doing an in-depth study of Paul's epistles this summer, I realized that Paul suffered. 
Oh yeah, a, yeah. a lot. And, and I think the, the bedrock here of what we're really discussing is that that suffering is crucial to our development as we are trying to pursue being as Christ-like as possible. Like, I do not believe that we are able to live our best life now and there's no suffering in that. I, I believe that we're not able to live a prosperous life without the dignity of sharing in the sufferings of Christ. And I think that's that's something that we need, like I said last week, that I believe suffering is coming. Suffering and is what it, causes you to turn right, to something. Right. right. And, and in addition to that, the thing I think, and I don't want to be too long in the tooth here because I think you just nailed it, but the last thing I, I want to say is that and, and I'm going to tell this story that might come across humorous, but I really, I meant it then and I meant it now. When I first became a Christian um, and I was going to Willow Praise Church, Larry Bogenreef was the pastor. He still is. And I remember that the, the one of the first times I had an opportunity to sit there and talk with him. And I was saved like four or five-ish months. And I, I was talking to him and I said, did Jesus fart? And, and like... There was a lot of people around, and they just heard that and they erupted, and they thought it was the most immature, you know, just r ridiculously stupid thing to say. And anybody knows my personality knows that, you know, I think dick and fart jokes are just f the funniest thing ever. Yeah. But in that, what Larry answered was he was tempted in every manner we were. And kind of chuckled and walked yeah. away. And that always stuck with me. And I thought, you know, to, to kind of back up your story... There isn't an aspect of our life on earth, our human existence, Christ being fully divine, fully God, mm. yet fully man. He was able to fully walk in the divine nature of God, yet being clothed with the potential to be an average, adult, sinful man. Yes. Yet did not and and that is a unique mystery but yes. it was his obedience it is what he suffered it, it is you know the not just not just what happened the final 24 hours of his life and not just those 40 days in the desert but it was everything it was every day it was right every encounter exactly he and could have displayed his godship right throughout or, all of or it. he could have chose to say you know what you guys can piss up a Absolutely. rope. I'm done. You know, uh, uh, which, you know, uh, admittedly, that's kind of my default with most things. But um, he didn't. And the attitude of thankfulness for that, the attitude of the suffering that we get to go through as his disciple, as his child, that is what is, and I need to remind myself of this, something we need to be eternally thankful for. And then last thing I'll say is that if we're able to, harness this these ideas and put them into practice especially over this upcoming holiday season this is the exact positioning of our heart that causes damage to the kingdom of darkness this is the exact positioning and, uh, and attitude of our heart that stifles the kingdom of gar darkness from growing so carl go ahead and pray us out and we're gonna put this episode to bed Lord, I thank you for the greatest sacrifice of all that we have to be thankful for every day until we see you in heaven, and that is you. I thank you that you came to earth for us and that you laid your life down and that you became the sacrifice that you serve as the priest for our sins and that we will worship you as the king of all kings forever one day in heaven. God, I pray that we would understand that out of our suffering, Lord, we minister to those who suffer. We're touched, we're moved, we have sympathy, we have empathy, because we know what it feels like to hurt, to have pain. We have scars. Lord, let us, through our hurt and our suffering, be obedient to you. Let us turn to you. Let our faith grow. 
let our trust grow and let our intimacy with you in relationship grow through that, Lord. I thank you. I coming into the Thanksgiving season never want to forget what you did for me. It's the core of who I am. It's at the core of our faith. It sustains us and it gives us eternal hope. So, Lord, we thank you for that and we praise you for that. And we just want to say that we give back to you our talents and our abilities. And even though they're limited and even though they're flawed, you get in the middle of that mess and you do great things. And that's the part that we can't do, the miraculous. So, God, I thank you and I praise you. Amen. Amen. We want to thank you guys for, for listening. Um, please share this. Once again, I, I know that people need to hear these things. So uh, but please, please continue to share. We are anywhere you can find podcasts under Flawedcast, CLE, Apple, Google Play, Spotify, Breaker, Anchor.fm. We're also on the video platform Rumble under Flawed Inc. You can find us on our social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Gadder, Getter, and Gab. We're all under Flawed Inc. There is a link below. Get a copy of my books, Miss Heart of Man Repair Manual. Uh, great for the holiday season for any man in your life. And our email is Flawed Inc. C L E at gmail.com. And we from Flawedcast team here wish you all a very, very happy Thanksgiving. And we are thankful for you. Thank you.